we already uh, uh, have noted that uh, this whole seminar is the brainchild of Professor Chakraborty, and uh, <coughs> he has uh, uh, worked on uh, ethics, philosophy of language, and he has uh, many important publications to his credit. So, without uh, wasting any more time, uh, let me request uh, Professor Chakraborty to present his uh, paper. It's called Hindu Virtue Ethics. For viable no, 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 the, the uh, end bit, this is the title. Okay, uh, it has been changed a little bit. Uh, environmental virtue ethics, a Hindu perspective on Hearst House quest. So, thank you, Nirmanaji. By the way, my uh, at very tender age, my uh, ma, my mother, um, taught me my name, Sri Sitam Shushekhar Chakravarti. So I am Sri Sitam Shushekhar. <laughs> Indian names have a meaning, uh, not semantic, uh, but nonetheless, in a pragma, from a pragmatic point of view, the meaning is very important. In her essay, Environmental Virtue Ethics, Rosalind Hurstals chalks out a blueprint for viable, viable future work in the area that promises true allegiance to the spirit of ethics. She looks for an accepted virtue. Well, this paper dates back to 2007. She looks for an accepted virtue or virtues which, given a new interpretation, I'm quoting her, are expected to act as foundation for the extended task at, at hand of building this fairly new branch of ethics alongside the traditional human-centered kind in existence where human interactions are the subject of study. Concurrently, she keeps her eyes open for any new virtue outside of the one once traditionally in use in virtue ethics, which might be found suitable exclusively for the purpose of build, building environmental virtue ethics in case the existing ones fail in the task. A little more bit of light if that can be done. She mentions the old virtues of prudence, I'm quoting, practical wisdom, compassion, and proper humility, unquote. In this venture, while alerting us to the analytical consequences that the corresponding, quote, old vices of greed, self-indulgence, short-sightedness, cruelty, pride, vanity, dishonesty, and arrogance lead on to. She, however, hastened to point out that the aforesaid virtues may not count as decisive toward building an environmental virtue ethics we want, free of the charge of being human simple. In other words, she says, environmental virtue ethics has not, cannot be built as yet. And I pose this question to uh, Michael Slope. Oh, he said, oh yeah, that's a problem. Eh? But we are um, proposing that there is a way out yeah. with the uh, help of, of the, from the Indian tradition. As for the possible, um, as for the possible new virtues, Hastams proposes two for consideration. The first one she indicates, I want to do philosophy, so I have to do it, you know, minutely. The first one she indicates connected to the healthy emotion, wonder, while she comes, she cannot come up with a name in the abstract noun form for it. She, this, this is what she says. She says that apprehension though, that the virtue may not be adequate for environmental ethics as the emotion of wonder is not exclusively directed to nature, thus possibly potent with the seeds of human centricity. She wants it free from human centricity. 
The second one in her list, list is respect for nature, quote and unquote, or rather, quote, being rightly oriented to nature, unquote, as she prefers to call it. Attractive as the new virtues are, they may, they may need to be clearly chopped out in concrete, non-question-begging terms. This is what she says, on top of being not human-centric. Certainly, no philosophical grounding can be secured to our satisfaction in the area of environmental virtue ethics, she cautions, so long as, so long as, as a virtue that is expected to provide the basis for the right explanation is missing. Such a failure in the quest for the right kind of virtue or virtues indeed falls in line with failures in attempts at doing environmental ethics outside of the area of virtue ethics. Well, the consequentialists also have failed, she says, <coughs> and the ontologists do. do. The, the environmental virtue ethics is really a challenge for all. <coughs> In so far as such attempts <coughs> simply end up in, issu in issuance of, quote, some fairly obvious prohibitions against wanton, gratuitous, selfish, materialistic, and short-sighted consumption, harm, destruction, and despoliation. Well, this is what Locke Pulse will be doing. Success in the area, it appears, you might have practical relevance as well on top in the area of constructing a virtue ethics for environmental ethics. <coughs> for, the, uh, for in providing the reasons for right actions vis-a-vis -vis the wrong ones, the ground is laid for inculcating a virtue that motivates the agent toward initiating appropriate actions on a journey to flourishing or living well. So this is virtue ethics. This is not in any words in the virtue. In this essay, I propose to posit a non-conventional virtue for consideration along the line her style has drawn for us in her paper. This to my mind, this is doing world philosophy. Uh, this to my mind will not only lay the foundation for environmental ethics from the virtue ethical perspective, but also the ethics as such, for ethics as such, in conformity with the expectations first house expresses at the beginning of her article. This is from first house quotation. It may well be that if we could find a way of releasing, releasing many human beings from the grip of the familiar, familiar vices, the change in our current ways of going on would be so extraordinarily radical that it would indeed adequately set the scene for all the changes the environmentalists dream of. Are. After all, no one suggests that we need a new ethic to deal with the human-centered moral problems of poverty, war, and quite generally, man's inhumanity to man. How well put. Good. We suppose, if, and what a big if, I'm just quoting her, we could somehow induce many more of ourselves to be truly compassionate, benevolent, unselfish, honest, unmaterialistic, long-sighted, just, patient, virtuous, in family, familiar ways, in short, the way human beings live and would be um, uh, radically would be radically different, and the entirely human-centered moral problems that our own vice, vices create would become things of the past. And if these hitherto intractable human-centered ones, why not the environmental ones as well? I believe the virtue, harmony within, that solves the, the problem. Thus, we will talk more about that. Thus, we will not be in need of separate virtues to account for different areas of ethics, while one single virtue covers all areas. 
the advantage in the ethic, virtue ethical treatment of environmental ethics we hope to see lies in providing the needed philosophical explanations thus paving, paving the ground for instilling the relevant virtue in individuals in society starting from childhood not through imposition but internalization instead ensuring thereby that the society is rightly tuned ethically in contrast to the prevailing situation today. The virtue I'm going to propose here is not Aristotelian. In fact, it comes from a tradition outside the Western, though not culture specific per se on that come, as the Aristotelian virtues are not specific to the ancient Greek culture. The virtue is harmony within. We'll see how the virtue provided, provides the needed foundation in the human-centric area of ethics relating to justice and care in society, <laughs> while at the same time helps us build environmental ethics on, on its basis. Uh, there is a section here, Harmony and Ethics, which... Um, oh, no, no, this, uh, I'm not going to say, this is the, the very... Uh, <coughs> vital part of the whole presentation. Harmony and ethics. The expression harmony has two senses. The first refers to a harmonious state that obtains on its own out there or in here, or is brought about on the basis of actions undertaken. The harmony one finds present in nature is of the former kind. Human intervention toward mass, ex mass exploitation of nature eats into it and ecolog ecological imbalance results. Those who believe in Gandhian socialism think that the so societal harmony it aims at is to be brought about by, by human involvement in the right way. So this is the, these are two, the two varieties, varieties of harmony. One just obtaining their own soul, and the other is to be brought about. Uh, in Marxism, I believe, uh, no harmony uh, is supposed to be brought about. Uh, uh, Gandhi really, he, uh, he really was concerned about harmony. Uh, that's his ahimsa. Two, the other sense, harmony pertains to an attitude to wit a disposition. Courage, by the way, is a mental disposition. So that's a virtue. <coughs> Typically, a character state, so if one is in harmony within, one has reached a character state. So that way it is a virtue. I'm trying to find out how it can be we are justified in calling it a virtue. Uh, which again one can work on towards it further as one can work on courage. I don't have courage, well I can work to make myself courageous. Gandhian so socialism is dependent on build, building this harmonious state within. That's the basis of Gandhian socialism. On the basis of which one would be motivated to a proper actions leading to the goal of building a harmonious society. Harmony within is a disposition that inspires to build harmony around, uh, resulting in doing good to others uh, as well as contributing to e ecological harmony. Uh, I would say that harmony in this uh, within <coughs> this uh, to, to refer to a philosophical concept, this is intentional. Uh, harmony within that's just staying there. It goes out. It is in, on its own. So that way it is naturalistic. It is, uh, we don't have to say it is God who is doing this or whatever the creation uh, mode has been. Been, but this is the uh, nature of the thing. It is the intention. Those are here. Uh, 
Here harmony is not just balance or, or equilibrium. Like harmony in music, it is creative in its aesthetic mode present in the ethical dimension. I wouldn't have time to go into uh, aesthetics. And is pleasing overall, certainly not binding, binding or depriving either to oneself or to others. Uh, Gandhi was never the prototype, nor the uh, Swami Vivekananda. He failed to achieve much of what he intended to, but he didn't suffer from dejection. As we tend to do, this society breeds a dejection. <coughs> Thus, harmony is not simply self-control that Aristotle talks about as a measure against self-indulgence or intemperance. So this is the virtue very much missing in Aristotle but adds a meaning to the onward flow of life. Harmony, in this second sense, is a virtue, I claim. Uh, any questions? The virtue harmony within is a character state that equips and prompts the possessor of the virtue to furtherance of her harmony within and without a process accompanied by a sustaining, unconditional joy manifest even in the midst of failures and the many challenges of the way, an intrinsic value which an individual intends to share with others. Um, <coughs> Ramakrishna mission <coughs> people, they uh, keep on harping, harping on Shanti and disharmony, and, uh, not to build an emperor, but to make everybody happy. The more one approximates the limited concept of perfect harmony within, the more is one away from greed and possessiveness, along with the other vices, <coughs> namely self-indulgence, short-sightedness, cruelty, pride, vanity, dishonesty, and arrogance, as enumerated by Hirsthaus, absence of which is a necessary condition indeed of the inner as well as the outer harmony to hold, so far as human beings are involved. Even for outer, so far as we are involved, we are given to the shape to the uh, outer state of affairs. A society that promotes, so it, mm, it doesn't uh, 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 relate only to the micro level, job karte raho with but it touches both levels, micro and macro. Uh, this is easy area. Hmm. We humans, um, we humans do cause harm to ecology short of the inner harmony. A society that promotes cultivation of this virtue. And if I mention this, oh, he looked the wadi. So that's discouraged. Unfortunately, in this society that operates here today. Mm. A society that promotes cultivation of this virtue paves the way to ending hum human exploitation associated with the vices mentioned, se severely or in combination. Retributive measures embedded in the legal system by themselves have been seen to have failed to lead to the goal exploited. This is demonstrated in recent history by the Wall Street crisis taking place on the heels of the Enron, Enron One, while no real solution is in sight relating to grid management, in spite of the legal checks and balances put in place to correct the wrongs. It might be relevant in this connection to bring to mind this part of bullying lately at schools in North America, leading often to deaths of mindless mass killings opening random fires at public places in astoundingly quick succession of repeats of similar events and the abundance mm, of other forms of violence in society, including the sexual, in spite of the legal de deterrence in uh, operation. And we may just mention the opioid crisis, mm. ganja, ganja crisis. Our Prime Minister, Canadian Prime Minister, he is uh, <coughs> uh, making us uh, uh, 
uh, trying his best to make room for you know, ganja. You know, it should be accessible. Yes, human right. Everybody should get it. The legal system on its own simply fails to ensure that people are happy, contented, and in peace, so that the irresistible inclination to indulge in violent overtures arising out of a deep-rooted discontent and unhappiness do not get to a widespread, if not epidemic proportion in society, as many believe has happened today. Here comes the need to cultivate the virtue. Uh, I will cut myself short, karma yoga and all that, I cannot go, and I cannot quote from Gita either. So, let me go. Uh, there is a um, brief uh, uh, summary of my uh, uh, first housemate um, of my uh, um, paper of um, harmony. I hope I find it. No, no, somewhere in Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. Up to now, we have laid bare to an extent, it is her summary, and she has given me permission to use uh, her, uh, what he, she wrote in correspondence, <coughs> to use uh, it publicly. Uh, she permitted me. Up, up to now, we have laid bare to an extent the threefold aspect of harmony. A, the harmony within, which is the verse, virtue, this is her wording. With harmony at the cognitive, affective, and cognitive levels, I am skipping that. And across the board, B, the harmony, this is her wording. The, again, the harmony amongst human beings in one's own society and the whole social world, that the virtue is meant to and helps promote and see the harmony of the individual and every society with the natural world, which also the humans look for and delight in promoting on the basis of the virtue. Okay. So let me skip, I go to the very end. So I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I intended to share with the harmony within uh, at three levels, uh, cognitive, cognitive, uh, cognitive, uh, uh, affective, and cognitive levels. So when I see something, uh, there is this harmony, harmony, I think how I can take care of this. So this is cognitive level. And then, uh, well, of course, I have been shaken up uh, in an affective level, all go, uh, working together. And then I take two measures, I try to, at uh, cognitive level. Um, so harmony really <laughs> works harmonious, acro harmoniously across the world. Let's see where is the, um, the last part. Harmony in environmental virtue ethics. Let me come back to the topic uh, I started with. Having laid out the features of, of the virtue harmony to an extent, let us see here how the new virtue harmony meets the problems that Hustles detects in relation to the other virtues as she is engaged in doing the blueprint for a future environmental virtue ethics. Taking recourse to the accepted virtues of compassion, benevolence, unselfishness, honesty, prudence, practical wisdom, and patience, with perhaps humility added to the list, we may seem equipped and ready to build an environmental virtue ethics on their basis, while the old vices of greed, self-indulgence, short-sightedness, lack of compassion, vanity, and dishonesty in the form of self-deception stand cancer. 
Okay, it's a battle. The possible snack, however, she uh, points this out, rearing its head is human centeredness, short sightedness. Uh, no, no, hu hu human centeredness, in as much as nature has its own status. So we do to, uh, things to nature, you know, main things, uh, to main things, uh, not because uh, it does some good to us, but independently of its relevance to humanity, <coughs> that the virtues taken together may not decisively reflect. This is a concern. Why, in other words, compassion or benevolence or even um, humility should be directed to nature for its own sake? Uh, harmony within that uh, provides the answer, but uh, these virtues don't. Simply saying that Hurst House shows Hill, the philosopher, doing that lack of hum humility to nature. Lack of humility, humility to nature makes the agent prone to treating other persons disrespectfully. So if I don't have a um, compassion to uh, nature, I lack compassion to human beings. So this is human centric. Or that we owe our grat gratitude to nature would amount to providing a human centric explanation. However, with harmony within in place, as a virtue, it is by natural to look for her harmony around, deal with the harmony found existing or missing for that matter in a harmonious way, way that is, be comfortable with attempts to preserve it or have it established where missing. Well, I continue my habit, the Hindu dharma habit, religious habit, if I, my it touches on, you know, some furniture or something, I bow down to it. Pay my respect, this is the Hindu dharma. I picked up at very tender age. Uh, the harmony in place, uh, uh, with harmony in place as a, uh, harmony within in place as a virtue, it is what natural to look for harmony ar around. That is, uh, be comfortable with attempts to preserve it or to have it established where missing. Here, nature is not left out of one's uh, center of attention with an exclusive focus on, on human interests. Since the harmony in nature, uh, nature is found important in its own right, independently of its instrumental relevance to human inter interest and concern. And the way to meet and inter interact with nature is harmonious. Two, in a broad way, humility is but a normal, so and so forth, let me uh, try to. Uh, or empathy itself, if, if it is alleged harmony, um, in sympathy has its uh, harmony and its vagueness. Well, there is vagueness in sympathy also, uh, or empathy. It's vagueness to the extent. Well, uh, our uh, pre um, American president, uh, he is empathetic. Uh, he really feels for the people of America. That this is uh, virtually what he, uh, the, you know, isn't the word empathy. Uh, the vague word has its vagueness to the extent that a dictator may justify his cruel action in reference to his alleged sympathy to the subject for their good. Do we do not disqualify the concept you know, harmony within on this count? Second, the other virtues are subsumed under <coughs> harmony within. We can refer to this ourselves very much as, as appreciate. Okay. So it shows the unity of the virtues. We can refer to them in case of need to define a situation, so and so forth. All right. Um, uh, if I may, uh, uh, quote from Tagore: "Stand in address to nature. Stand in front of my eyes." Tagore in India, very seriously in very influential quarters, is uh, stamped as Deshadri going against the country. He is Deshadri. Mm -hmm. 
I ain't well, I'm fascinated with Tagore, not because he happens to be Bengali. Actually, he is perhaps one of the very few world figures. He's not just Bengali or Indian. Neither is uh, 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 Swami Vivekananda or Sri Aurobindo. Uh, stand in front of my eyes. Add to the glamour of the earth that looks on waiting. Also, the sky full of the sun and the stars, the world filled with life. I have indeed my place in their midst, and my song rises out of wonder. The upheaval of time eternal rocks the world with its tides, pulling at the blood rushing in my veins, and my song rises out of Well, uh, thanks uh, for the Chaturvati, and uh, as far as I can understand, the uh, main point that he wants to raise in his uh, presentation is, uh, is to defend the idea of harmony as the basal value on the basis of which uh, one could uh, construct a full-blown uh, you know, uh, environment of poetry, ethics. So, um, thank you again. So, can we spend some time uh, for well, questions and well, discussions? Well, better, uh, first let him do and uh, together questions. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, is, is, that, is that okay with you? Okay. 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 So, so as, as Professor Chakuti suggested, Let's move on to the next speaker, Ananda Chakravarti, and then we can, you know, uh, 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 take up questions and discussions on yeah. both both the presentations. Yeah, this shows the relevance so, of this concept to this. So, uh, so Ananda uh, uh, is uh, 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 an expert in uh, professional business ethics. Uh, he presently is the director at KPM Six International KPMG. International markets, and uh, uh, he had his basic training in political science and communications uh, in, in Toronto. So he has been uh, doing work uh, uh, in so far as application of our ethics is concerned in the, corp in the corporate world. So we thanks uh, uh, Ananda for for uh, uh, you know um, uh, accepting uh, to present his uh, paper here today. So Ananda, please. So first of all, it's. Uh, the work is just beginning, and I'm grateful to be here with you all. I, I, I do need the, the PowerPoint um, thing, but I'll just get started. In typical corporate fashion, I'll just get right to the point, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, it's here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Is it audible? You want to come over here? Um, well, I have. He's not visible. Oh, he's not visible. Oh, he's not visible. <laughs> but then you can come, come here. And but you're going to have to look at the PowerPoint, the screen anyway. Why don't you get it? Why don't you get it? Yeah. No, I don't want it. Because you're going to look there anyway. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but people also want to look at you. So. It's easier to... Okay. Well, you, you can come here. I'll focus on the microphone. Or just here. Why don't you stand here? You can also aim for the Um, as we wait for the presentation, I'll just begin. So, I think from the informal feedback that I've been getting from you all, we both, we all, we both, if I say from the academic world and from the corporate world, we understand that there's a need to build bridges. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. And I think, uh, maybe you just, yeah, thanks. So I think um, if there's a couple of things I would like to leave you with, with, with respect to my remarks today, the first is that we need, um, we need a model for virtue ethics to apply to the world of business now more than ever. And that has to do with the extraordinary times that we're living in. These, these next 15 to 20 years. Um, yeah, just do that. So is this back? Okay, 
So we need a model of virtue ethics that can be applied to the business world urgently. And we have a window of 15 to 20 years now where there's going to be extraordinary change. And, uh, and philosophers need to act, right? Uh, we don't have thousands of years. We don't have a lot of time for this. And I'll, I'll get into it, what I mean by this. And the second point is the standard, for lack of a better word, I'm going to use Western, but the standard paradigm of uh, ethics, business ethics, is not enough for today, let alone what we're going to see in, in the near future. So um, we need it. We need a new model for virtual ethics, and we need new sources of ideas. Um, and, and today, obviously, we're talking about ideas from the Indic, the Hindu uh, spiritual tradition. So I'm going to focus my remarks very quickly on a talk given by Dominic Barton, who is an important business leader and a thought leader. And Dominic Barton is the former, he's the global managing partner emeritus of McKinsey and Company. For those of you who don't know who McKinsey is, McKinsey is probably the preeminent management consulting firm in the world. They don't maintain a very um, kind of uh, flashy presence, if you will. They, they have a low-key presence. But basically, <coughs> this, is the, this is the firm and this is the person that global heads of state, CEOs of the biggest companies in the world, and NGO leaders turn to when they're worried, when, they, uh, when mm -hmm. they're in trouble, when they have, when they're excited about an idea. They go to McKinsey, they go, and, and I say this with trepidation, my, my own firm competes with them, but I have to say they, you know, so Dominic Barton is somebody who has his finger on the pulse of business and, um, and, and the world around us. Um, so he, so he has recently retired. Actually, he's uh, quite interested in Asia, particularly. He was the Asia managing chairman before the global, and currently he's also a Canadian. He's recently accepted a, a role as the Canadian ambassador to China. So he has a particular interest in Asia, and I'll get to why that's relevant in a moment. But he has some thoughts. He's also sorry. He's also an Oxford Rhodes Scholar, so he's an academic, academic himself. He's interested in the role of character in leadership. The talk that I'm referring to <coughs> is about character in leadership and about the role of business and society and the role, importantly, of philosophy in business. So that's a little bit about uh, Dominic Barton. And he talks about three gravitational forces, if you will, that are going to change the world and have already started to change the world, but that will continue to change the world in the next 15 to 20 years in ways that, and, and then beyond that, in the remainder of the 21st century, in ways that are pretty much left to our imagination. Um, and the three gravitational forces that he refers to, and I've modified them slightly, actually, he had five, but I, I kind of modified them, felt them, if you will. Uh, the first is a shift of economic power to uh, from, from the so-called developed world to the emerging markets or the re-emerging markets. So the center of economic gravity in the world is going to go back to Asia as it was a thousand years ago or so. Uh, and that's going to happen fairly quickly. Uh, and that has some implications with respect to how business is done because currently we work, and even our business ethics as we know them, operate in a, a very, what he calls an Anglo-Saxon capitalist. His, uh, his, words, his words are Anglo-Saxon capitalism and how that's actually becoming uh, increasingly irrelevant and will be in the, in the new world as we go through it. And, um, and the way Asia does business is very different from the way the West does business. So I don't know if anyone has experience doing business in China or with the Chinese. Their concept of time is very different. In the West, we have quarterly. In every three months, you have to make money and, and show your investors. This is what you say? The, well, this is what I my remark on this. And in China, the concept of time is that the, the idea of investing and getting the return on that is, it could be 20 years, it could be 50 years. It, it's very different. In India, the way business is done, it's very relationship-based. As you, I don't have to talk to, to this group about how, how things are done in India, but if you think about how, uh, what, what happened with the demonetization situation in 2016, whatever your thoughts are on that, the fact is 
India got through that largely on the basis of relationship-based transactions as opposed to contract-based transactions, which is the way things are done in the West. So the point is that the way we do business is going to, to shift as the capital shifts from West to East. And the third gravitational force is the changes in demographics and the new social deal. And this has to do with, I'll just sum it up quickly, with basically we're an aging world. It's a, it's a, we're going to be older. And by 2050, 50% um, of the world will be over 65. And that, that includes me and, and all of us. Um, so we're going to be an old, and that's the first time that's ever happened. And the population um, is declining in the West. And, it's, and the only places it's growing is pretty much Africa and some parts of some parts of Asia, and even Asia is going to start declining uh, as we get wealthier. But the the idea is, so as we get older, and then as, if you think of like the one, two, three there, I, I think of it as a one plus two equals three. So with all of the shifts of economic power and all of the sweeping technology changes that are going to happen, that's going to put a lot of people out of work. And a lot of people are going to be struggling, they're going to find themselves um, kind of at a loss what to do. And that's already happening now. But what do we do with these groups of people, the truck drivers who are out of work when the vehicles are, auto, uh, are autonomous? What do we do with the knowledge workers in Hyderabad or Bangalore uh, whose work is automated very quickly and, and it'll just sweep like, like fire? We, um, that's not a comment on Bangalore specific, I'm just you know, trying to bring it to life. And I'll add my own, I think, so uh, Professor Chakraborty mentioned about the, the epidemic of, um, of depression and things like that that are sweeping. I'm not trying to paint a doom and gloom picture here, but this is in the US, which is the richest country in the, in the world, um, we have an opioid crisis. And, uh, and there's an interesting statistic on this as I looked it up. Last year, and Lisa, keep me honest here, I, I, I think, uh, well, this is from CNN anyway. Um, the U.S. Surgeon General in April of last year issued an advisory recommending that Americans carry with them an opioid overdose reversing drug, which means the chances are that you'll, in, you may encounter someone who's had an opioid overdose dose. So you should have something in your pocket that helps them. It's like a first aid kit in wartime or something like that. So this is, it's not just, uh, you know, not just a newspaper headline, this is a, a real serious issue. And the Surgeon General doesn't issue these advisories very often. The last one was 10 years ago when pregnant women were advised not to drink alcohol. So, so he has that kind of um, importance. And that's the, the kind of some of the ma macro trends that we're dealing with. I added that yellow box in myself as, uh, as, as I was reflecting on Professor Chakravarti's points as well. Um, so, Leadership in the 21st century will require, so just to summarize again, just to reiterate, I hope I'm not you know, re uh, belaboring the point, but things are gonna change quickly. So how you lead in this world will also have to change. You don't know necessarily what's going to happen next, and that means you have to balance, so there's two points here, the microscope and the telescope, which is, the microscope is you've gotta understand what needs to be done now. And these, these, this terminology was actually borrowed from the former Canadian Minister of Finance, Jim Flaherty, who's uh, I think since passed away. But he was talking about, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a finance minister. I have to run the country. I have to do what's good for it today. But I've also got to look in the long view of you know, what's, what's good for us for the next several years. So it's balancing that short term and long term. And then critically, this is the main point of, of Barton's talk here, is on character and leadership, which is it's, it's more important who you are than what you do going forward in, in leadership. The, the performance measures of a leader will be more based on who you are than what you do. And I think um, Professor Banjope actually was reading uh, some, some work by a young scholar that was alluding to those things. But that's basically what, what Barton's ideas um, go into. So what, what he does is he talks about 
a few, I'll give a few examples. I've just brought to, to light a couple of the examples what leaders do and who leaders are. And, and the character, as, as my father, as Professor Chakraborty summed up at the beginning, the character is, is um, can you explain that? It's constituted by the virtues. The, the virtues make up, the, the character is a state of mind that's built up of the virtues, if you will. Know, that's an acceptable uh, way of phrasing it. Um, so very quickly, I'll just go through. So prioritize and compartmentalize. Uh, what do you do when you're the, the CEO of the, big ta the biggest taxi company in the world, and suddenly you get a memo that there's a new company called Uber or Ola, and that they're going to make you irrelevant in the next three months? What, and, and you have three months to work with your workforce, reskill them, or do what, whatever you might need to do very quickly to become relevant. <coughs> what, what do you do? So prioritizing and compartmentalizing is, a, is something that a leader will need to do and to be able to absorb, absorb shocks very quickly. We all know where they're going to come from, but the leader has to be prepared to absorb the shock and keep moving forward. Um, think long term. I, I think I've already covered that a little bit, but the idea on it and the example that Barton gives is the former CEO of AT&T, Randy Stevenson, when he was faced with a lot of his workforce becoming potentially redundant, rather than lay them off, what he did was was he created a reskilling program for 90,000 of his people, of the people working under him, so that they could be relevant in the next five to 10 years. So the, uh, the, the phrase is anticipating the second bounce of the ball. So a leader needs to be able to be intuitive and to understand what's going to, to happen next. And then managing energy over time and being purpose driven. I, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of skip those for now. I think they're relatively self evident. But importantly, I think if we focus on the virtues that Barton identifies, there are three that he thinks that are really applicable to the business leader going forward. And it's the three that are in this red circle there. The selflessness, decisiveness, and resilience. And I'll go through these um, in, in a moment. But we have I think to understand, and in light, I, I'm treating this part of the talk, and indeed this is part of the same session, as an extension of, if we think of harmony within, or some of uh, as a, a meta virtue, we have to think about, and I, I, maybe I'm fast forwarding already, but in the interest of time, where will these, so how will a leader become, or learn selflessness? How will a leader know uh, what the basis of which she or he uh, needs to be decisive? Or where does the idea of resilience, you fall down and you pick yourself up, where does that come from? It's got to come from somewhere. And I think we think that harmony within is a, a, a kind of a, a meta virtue or a grounding virtue that can serve a, a major function here. But, um, so I've already gone through a little bit uh, on that. So the prevailing Western model here, this slide is pretty much the same as previous, but I just want to give you a little bit of a view from the field because that's where I don't operate in the academic world, I operate on the front lines of the business world. And I can say that the, with respect to all of these virtues that are in circles in red, the prevailing thinking, and by, when I say Western, I'm not taking a shot at the West, I'm just talking about the, the dominant kind of mindset, and in fact, the the culture of corporate Delhi or Singapore or Hong Kong is probably more Western in this way than uh, the culture of San Francisco or Amsterdam. So it's not a, a, geo it's a, it's not a geographic thing. It's just an you know, established paradigm thing. It's all pretty utilitarian. And by the way, I may be using the terms utilitarian and consequentialist uh, synonymously, erroneously, but forgive me if that's the case. Um, but it's largely utilitarian, activism oriented, and I don't know if people are familiar with the UN Global Compact, but this is basically a, um, a set of 10 principles that the United Nations has released, and the idea is a lot of businesses become signatories to this. And I won't read out all 10, but the, the ca there's four categories of them, and, and it's all about human rights, labor, environmental protection, and anti-corruption. That those are the buckets of the, the prevailing kind of mindset on 
uh, on corporate ethics. And my, in my opinion, this is, um, it says very little, if anything, about a deep uh, mindset um, transformation or uh, what the term of like, uh, becoming this kind of idea. It's more about the basis of a perfunctory tick box kind of exercise that people can go through and, and feel good about themselves and their companies. <coughs> so that's, that's basically, and I think the, the Hindu spiritual perspective is a more um, comprehensive one, root to branch, and it's compatible with, although not reducible to, religion, secularism, and secular philosophy, and science as well, which we'll hear more about um, from Professor Mukti and others as, as we go through it. So I think in the next couple of minutes, what I'll do is uh, I want to I wanna just I'm not going to have time to go through everything here, but if I can examine the three virtues, selflessness and resilient, decisiveness and res resilience quickly through the dominant. I won't even cover really the dominant, the Western um, one. One is called servant leadership, which is basically something that was uh, developed in the 1970s. It's more of a technique. Show the people that you are their servant and by being their servant, you are leading them. Uh, the, gra the philosophical gravity, I think, in this, and the uptake, uh, I think there's a relationship bet between these two. The uptake of the idea is not very significant, and the philosophical grounding of it is pretty flimsy, I think. Um, and that's probably why it hasn't really taken root. People generally treat servant, servant leadership with a bit of suspicion and cynicism. This is in my experience front line in the corporate world, whereas the Hindu model, we will hear from Professor Mukherjee on Rajashi leadership, is a much more grounded, the idea of sadhana, uh, that, that of the leadership coming as a byproduct from the sadhana, uh, coming and addressing what Professor Chakraborty related about the affective, the cognitive, affective, and um, cognitive functions all being related to each other, is a much deeper and more applicable model. Again, this isn't uh, us against them or anything like that. I'm just trying to draw the contrast. So decisiveness, um, let me, can we play the clip now? I, I, yeah. I have a clip of Dominic Barton here, maybe we can. Decisiveness. Yeah. The two to go together. And I think, again, there's the, the issue of judgment as I come through it and decisiveness. I think you know, President Obama has talked about this, that unfortunately the toughest decisions come up to where he is. I went, okay, I got the message. And he, and he said, no, but I would more wants to. He's someone else. It's more about Clorox went to see uh, the, the two to go together. And I think, again, there's the, the issue of judgment as I come through it and decisiveness. I think you know, President Obama has talked about this, that unfortunately the toughest decisions come up to where he is because they haven't obviously been resolved. And often those decisions are right versus right decisions, right? This is where many CEOs I've talked to say, if I could do it over again, I actually would have redone part of my education. I would have taken more philosophy. You may not know this, one of the most popular MOOCs for CEOs is basic philosophy. And you'd say, well, why, why is that? This is the next slide. There's not, there's not a CEO here on this picture, but it's, a, it, it, it's a, um, basically a, a picture trying to represent Fonterra, which is the largest dairy company in the world. I remember meeting the CEO and I said, what did you learn? And he said, the, har the hardest thing uh, that I've had to learn is how to deal with right versus right decisions. I said, well, w I'm not a philosopher. Tell me, what does that mean? He said, okay, I get a decision like this once a week. Let me tell you what last week's was. One of my researchers, research scientists, came to me and said, we can increase the production of one of our average dairy cows by 25% if we abort the fetus 
three weeks before the calf should be born. Okay, so you, one lens could be, it's an animal, I don't, I'm, we're making milk, you know, we've got to produce milk, we have got to do it. So you could have that view. So the second view is you could say, I could have that view, but worry about what my consumers might think, because they may not think that way, and say, well, that, that seems a little bit unethical. Or you may just not believe that that's the right thing to do in treating an animal. Because there's no there's no guidebook for that type. I can't I don't I can't go to a business school that's going to tell me how to make that trade off. It's a it's it's judgment. But you have to make a call. And he said I get one of those types of things a week uh, as as we, as we go through it. So again, I think thinking of that uh, is important. The notion of being destructive and challenging your orthodox. So I'll close here with, uh, I, I had more, and we can talk more you know, over the next couple of days. But there you see critically that he said, you can't learn these things from a business school. So where does it come from? Right? And, and to fast forward to the, the punchline here, that this has to come down to a, a virtue. And I, 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 I hope that people caught all the, what he was talking about was you know, the three scenarios where literally they were based on deontology, you know, this is wrong, so I'm not going to do it, uh, consequentialism, what, what will my consumers think, I don't care, but what will they think, and then the other one is, it doesn't feel right, that doesn't, I, that doesn't sit well with me, which is the, the virtue part of it. So I, I'll close here with a quote from Tagore's Sadhana, The Realization of Life, which I think, um, well, it speaks for itself. When man's consciousness is restricted only to the immediate vicinity of his human self, the deeper roots of his nature do not find their permanent soil. His spirit is ever on the brink of starvation. And in the place of health, healthful strength, he substitutes rounds of stimulation. Then it is that man misses his inner perspective and measures his greatness by its bulk, and not by its vital link with the infinite, judges his activity by its movement, and not by the repose of perfection, the repose which is in the starry heavens, in the ever-flowing rhythmic dance of creation. So in that, in, with that quote, I'll end, um, and, and I think it's a beautifully poetically put idea that uh, our actions are related to our nature. Our nature is related to the nature of uh, what's around us and, and in our life. So with that, I'll stop and hopefully we'll have a few minutes possibility of, uh, of a discourse uh, on virtue ethics uh, um, within the realm of uh, business work. So now uh, both the presentations are, are open uh, for discussion, so please uh, come forward with your questions or comments. Yes, I think uh, it's all. Uh, in your paper, you mentioned you had a section on Gita, which you skipped. Oh. But, I, but I guess I, I have two questions about that, just because yeah. I'm, I'm curious about some details on what you mean by harmony within from a Hindu perspective, what are the Sanskrit cognate terms that you're thinking of, and what is being harmonized with what? I mean, how does the Gita help us? Well, um, there is an expression in the second chapter of the Gita, which is Samatva Yoga Uchate. The word Samatva has been translated in English by Gandhi as even-mindedness. But what is this even-mindedness? Uh, well, actually, the word sama has been used in several senses all through the Gita. Sama grivanka, grivakayam, uh, you know, when you sit in the tana posture, sama. But is this even mindedness straight? So um, I talked with, uh, at some length, it is no length at all actually, with Rupa a couple of years ago, difficult to find time. and. Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> I get reassured Samatvam could be even um, uh, harmony within, or at least 
mean, samatva cannot, even-mindedness cannot be there without harmony within. At least, harmony within is a precondition for samatva. I will say it is harmony within, and that's the spirituality, the dhyana that establishes me. What does dhyana do to me? Dhyana yoga, he talks about uh, later on. Uh, you do this arjuna uh, to be placed the right way, but how is that person placed the right way? Well, this was, I have to develop that. No, I didn't have a chance to refer to the, you know, this is the Western um, frame of reference which we, unfortunately we are following today, is you cannot s refer to a scripture, but our scripture is different. You can argue about our scriptures. You can always say, no, I can go that far, but absolutely this is wrong here. Mm. Uh, that is possible in our tradition. Uh, there have been so schools and sub-schools and all that. So that's, that's the word, Samantha. Yeah. So I had uh, questions for both of you. Firstly, <coughs> in, uh, in Quran and in Vidyan, uh, especially as you're speaking about it in relationship to environment, okay, uh, there's sort of emphasis in there that it's connected in some uh, fundamental way with harmony with us as well. Uh, so can you, can you say something about that? Well, uh, uh, <coughs> Well, it doesn't presuppose the harmony without. I mean, if one asks how is that there, but we can define it in some ways. Well, it is difficult, certainly, but uh, this is an area uh, where virtue ethics is very much engaged in, is what's the role, what's the place of the agent who has imbibed the virtue, who is uh, following up on the virtue, you know. Certainly there is room for the agent, you know. What is the virtue, harmony within? How is the, well, then the question comes, Sri Ramakrishna, Ramana Martha Marshi and all that, we can point to them and try to uh, analytically proceed. So, yes, uh, I mean, how is it, uh, mm, absolutely divorced from the harmony within. No, not, that's not the intention. How do they relate? But anyways, the harmony is there. Yeah, this is all harmony, one word. How does one affect the other? First, develop the harmony within. And then we are able to relate with and understand also we are equipped to answer this question. Only if harmony within has developed. Uh, it is not as answering a question mm, by, uh, by uh, formulating a formula and then the question is addressed. And then it's all of my question is uh, So you pointed out about uh, opioid abuse, which is uh, a significant issue, I think perhaps more in the West, I'm not sure. But there's another abuse that is perhaps even more endemic and more uh, global, that is device abuse. Uh, I'm sorry? Device, device abuse. No, no, no. Device, device abuse. Device abuse. People walking into and looking into yeah. their, uh, yeah. Yeah. so much so that people are, this has now become uh, necessary to legislate that. Uh, yeah. So I was talking about device abuse. Do I need to uh, so device abuse, which uh, which has required uh, in some places, some jurisdictions, legislation to say that if you're operating a vehicle and you're caught yeah. using your device, there's the consequences. So uh, this is a, I mean, a, an even bigger issue. Which I, I wonder if people are paying attention to, uh, and if the uh, consequence of this is is not just um, uh, contained in an individual. It's like it's going to spread like a kind of uh, disease. Uh, and so much so that it's going to raise an existential crisis when we depend more and more on our devices they can do more and more for us uh, the question is what is my purpose so from from a uh, very quickly my perspective on this i don't have the answer uh, it's all worked out but the idea 
and the urgency of the need for philosophers on this is the engineers are working on this and the devices are slowly disappearing. So right now, if I ask you a question, you can, you, even if you don't know it, you can find the answer within 30 seconds. We know how through your, but the device will slowly disappear and become more and more a part of you. So the answer to that is, instead of me bumping into people, the, the engineers are working on devices that allow me not to do that. The problem is the engineers are working on our existential problems and not philosophers. This is something that Yuval Noah Hariri has pointed out in this now famous quote. He says, philosophers are very patient people. Engineers are far less patient. And investors are the least patient of all. So the problem is that the engineers are working on this, and we need philosophers to work on it. I know that didn't answer your question, but that's not exactly Yeah, Two things that are very important for family. One is that if you believe in giving rather than grabbing, you will be very happy. Giving always gives happiness, and happiness gives harmony. Because you're not trying to grab anything. You're satisfied what you have. That's one important thing. Second thing is, usually we say, live and let live. But Indian thinking is, live and help others live. That's very different. That you're trying to empower other people. And that's the real source of happiness and harmony. Well, thanks for the elaboration, yes. Yeah, please. No, uh, I have a small question. I have also worked on Bhagavad Gita. I have a book on Bhagavad Gita. And you can, you can cut this. Right. No, small question. Can we have Samat to vote without having Ekat to vote? I'm, I'm one sorry? Ekat to vote. Samatha vote without Ekat. You cannot have Samatha vote unless you have Ekat to vote. This is, you can say, two information I want to give. One of them is, I have a paper on business ethics of Jamna Lal Bajaj, published by Institute of Anthony Study Dwarka. Jamna Lal Bajaj, I hope some of you know, he was supposed to be the fifth son of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, only man, Gandhi trusted as being the true trustee. That is one. The second information I want to give you is one of my students, Neil Gautam, of Neat Silja, he has worked on Bhagavad Gita and leadership of Bhagavad Gita and the corporate leadership. And he had also interviewed about 50 corporate leaders, including the <laughs> top leaders, Tata's and Rami Bajaj and other top the one hand, and on the other hand, some of the great Buddhist scholars, like Rim Putri and others. He had a thesis, so I would like him to get in touch with you, and he could be of some help, because he had not found any of some thesis. You were mentioning about compatibility with spirituality, secularism, and science. Yes. Yes, right. Uh, no. This is also a point of uh, contemplation as to in what sense we are looking at science. Because there have been great scientists who have made very deep critiques of science. Like I'll just give two examples. Uh, Albert Einstein was as much a philosopher also. I quote, and certainly we should take care not to make the intellect our god. The intellect has a sharp eye for methods and tools but it is blind to ends and values." Unquote. The other is from Bertrand Russell. Uh, even more important than knowledge is the life of emotions. Unless men increase wisdom as much as knowledge, increase of knowledge will be increase of sorrow. So in what sense we are looking at science? I think there is one. 
And the second observation I have is about servant leadership you mentioned, Robert Greenleaf. Yeah. You know, much before him, you know, Maharaji is here. Swami Vivekananda had talked about servant leadership. He said that a leader has to be dasasya dasa, not just a servant, but a servant of servants. The point of unacceptable servant leadership in the West is possibly because uh, there is not a positive orientation towards the notion of servant. Our notion is seva. I, I, I disagree. I don't think that's why the uptake is not there. I think it's just seen as disingenuous. And the point of anchoring it in a virtue is that that, like Swami Vivekananda comes from a, you know, that's solid ground. Mm -hmm. That his comes from with green leaves. He read uh, um, Pramanas' Journey to the East. No, it was this journey to the east, which was after Siddhartha. And I mean, it's a little, I mean, it's, it's, it's not on solid ground, right? And people treat it with suspicion and cynicism. But I don't think it's that they look down on servant, uh, the idea of servant. I think they think, it's like, think of the term civil servant or public servant. What do we think of politicians typically? We, you know, in a is Yeah, yes. so I think that's what the issue is, not so much not liking the term servant. There's another, just one, one more point I'd add. No, the current notion of you know, Western model of ser service is if I deliver the service and someone receives it, the one who's recipient is the prime beneficiary. Whereas in the Indian notion of service or seva, it is a person who's delivering the service is the prime beneficiary because the others who are receiving the service are giving him an opportunity to serve. That is what I actually yeah. think. I just I think last question. Professor Modi so, can address the science uh, part in his uh, talk. Yeah, I, I guess we have the last question from Professor Sanya. Okay, I, yes, both the lectures were really very, very interesting. And I have some question to Professor <laughs> Senior Chakraborty, Professor Chakraborty. In fact, I always hear that human centricity, that is really problematic. Why? Why in ethics? Because where from this ethical, we say that understanding comes, where from we derive or where from we can account for the very origin of ethics, it is from human. Well, uh, well taken, human centricity in this specific context means for the sake of human beings, where human being is the, um, the standard, uh, the ideal standard, for the sake of whom, for the sake of nature, or for the sake of human beings. That's what he does. Huh. No. So, so actually, this reverts back to the stand of consequentialism. You know, it is whether there is an intrinsic good that nature holds, so this intrinsic and extrinsic good, that's the area where the question moves around. This is uh, human centricity. In fact, what it is about. I would like to suggest to reformulate the very notion of human centricity. Because actually human centricity, it is a very vague, inappropriate notion. It has to be further reformulated, redefined. That is, in which particular sense we are taking the notion. Because the notion that we get from the Western understanding of ethics, especially contemporary thinkers, when they talk about human centricity with regard to ethics, they are taking the notion in a very narrow sense. This is what I would like to harp on. I think, uh, okay. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, both senior and junior Chakravarti. And, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for your participation in joining us. So, I guess now we will move for lunch and then we will assemble here again. Uh, by two by two o'clock for the next academic session. Thank you very much.